I tell you, so today we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, and last time we finished at verse 48. Uh, Jesus, at this point, has done the incredible, impossible miracle of, uh, as a final sign before his sacrifice on the cross, proving that he was who he claimed to be. And we had seen two reactions to this. As many believed in him, as he confirmed the faith in many others as well, but it also became the turning point in the ministry where those that refused to believe in him just couldn't stand it anymore, and they doubled down on getting rid of Jesus. Uh, this is probably not the most enlightening, uh, uplifting teaching because of the, the content we have here. But uh, we're, we're going to start uh, our teaching at verse 49. But for context, I'm going to pick it up and touch back on uh, from verse 45. So in the New King James Version, we'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them of the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the, the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. <clears throat> so last time, we we'll pause here for a moment. Last time we observed that uh, the, the insight into the conspiracy to put Jesus to death here. It was clear the religious leaders were uh, fearing for their positions. It was also clear that they had no fear or faith in God himself. Um, you know, they're supposed to be serving him. They're supposed to be teaching others about him. But their fear was not of God, but that they wouldn't be big shots anymore in the area. They'd maybe lose their jobs. Maybe they'd lose their high standing and status in society as, as uh, they were found out to be who they really were. So we continue in verse 49. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now, this he did, say, he did not say on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not only for that, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? Now, both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. So I'll conclude there, uh, verse 57, at the end of the chapter. So, again, let's take a look at what was going on here. When the religious leaders said that the Romans will come and take their place, they meant the temple in Jerusalem. When they said they'd take away their country, they meant at least the region of Judea, but probably all of Israel. Uh, and, you know, I, I find it just so ironic. The, you know, the main thing that set Israel apart from the others surrounding them in the other countries was monotheism, right? The belief in one true and living God, Yahweh. As we say sometimes, uh, you know, his name is un unpronounceable to them, but it, it was they were unique and set apart in this idea. They didn't worship many different gods. They didn't worship, you know, non-living or, or, or living men or dead as gods. They didn't worship imaginary gods that were controlling the weather and nature. They didn't make idols, carving them with their hands and worship those. And yet it was in the religious leaders attempt to preserve what they consider their own, the temple to God in Jerusalem, that God's temple had literally become an idol, become a man-made idol for these religious leaders. Kind of wild, isn't it? They feared the God of the other country so much, namely Caesar, the emperor, 
who considered himself to be God, they were afraid that he would come and destroy their God, the temple, if Jesus were to gain political power. Um, yeah, kind of odd. It, it was so important to them that, that they were literally willing to kill Jesus to preserve their God, their idol, their temple, as they saw it. Um, but, you know, we, we think, you know, obviously this is odd, but we see in Psalm 2, the, best, the very second Psalm, verses 1 and 2, it says, Why do the nations rage and the people, and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. See, Jesus had always talked about the kingdom of God, not an earthly kingdom. Um, you know, in the many parables, in the synoptic gospels, we see many parables, and there's a sharp, sharp contrast between the kingdom of God and the earthly ways. So that was a contrast Jesus was always making and saying, you know, these are two different things. This is, this is the way it works. But the religious leaders that were there refused to see it. No, they, they still considered, considered the temple of God to be their place belonging to them, not to God. And they worked to build an earthly following instead of building the kingdom of God. Sadly, many church leaders today actually do the same thing, thinking of the church as theirs instead of the church as being God's and it really belongs to Jesus. So the life lesson for us, wherever we are, whatever we're doing in the, in the kingdom, in, in the planet is work to build up the kingdom of God and give your worship only to the one who's worthy, Jesus. Work to build up the kingdom of God and give your worship only to the one who's worthy, Jesus. Now, we've seen in history that embracing Jesus and following him results in blessings and prosperity for a nation. So, you know, let's lay aside the notion that these religious leaders were honestly concerned that the Romans would be irritated as Christ's gospel advanced. I don't really see that as something that was a reality. Um, you know, I've seen others that have commented, you know, very strongly, this was utterly false. This was never even a, a thought that went through their minds, but it went through their mouths, though. Uh, but following Jesus has never been harmful to a kingdom, to province, to states. Never was harmful to Rome as a people, but it was highly beneficial. The Romans had no fear of people believing in Jesus. They left him alone. Uh, in fact, Jesus taught men to give tribute, to pay their taxes to Caesar. He said not to fight back against people when they were doing evil to them. He taught, taught them, you know, go an extra mile. If they force you to do something against your will, to be gracious and go an extra mile uh, beyond what you're asked to do. Uh, and even when he went to trial later on, we, we see the Roman governor at Jesus' trial found no fault in him. Okay, so then, all that's verification. And, and Jesus freely admitted to others and to the, the, the governor, you know, the kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. But it's a spiritual kingdom. Now, on the other hand, the hearts of those that rejected Jesus, this was a different story. Um, you know, his own people, Israel, rejected him. That rejection by anyone ultimately results in spiritual, political, physical destruction of entire nations. In fact, we see within the lifetime of many of the people that were here at this meeting that the, the priest called, and obviously the lifetime of John, who wrote this, the ruin of the temple. And indeed, the entire nation of Israel was totally destroyed. And it wasn't because Jesus was made a political ruler and seized power, but it was a result of the lack of belief in Jesus. So what was the real danger they were facing? That the Romans would move against the Israel nation because of the priest's attitude, probably. Okay? <laughs> they were conniving. I mean, obviously they were conniving. Uh, but it wasn't because of Jesus. Let's look uh, at verse 49. And one of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now the high priest, what is that? <laughs> okay. 
Well, back before the Jews were exiled, as you read through the Hebrew Scriptures, we see that God had established a priesthood through the Levites, through the family of Levi. He led his people through Moses, then through Joshua, through Judges, through um, the prophets, in fact. And then Israel wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted to have their own king. And that's really what got them in trouble, and eventually they got exiled away from their country. Well, you know, after a period of time, they came back in. After that exile, they reestablished this uh, authority from God through the priesthood. And the high priest they put in place was responsible to serve in the most holy place in the temple. The high priest was by divine appointment. It really was something that God had said, this man should be here. This was the heir, the heir male to the house, usually the oldest male in the house of Aaron. Uh, he was appointed, appointed for the entirety of his natural life, and then it passed down to his eldest son. But in those days, you know, they, they changed things up. They made deals with the Roman powers, okay? They become, this had become not quite an annual office, but sometimes it changed year to year, the high priest, because the Romans kind of helped make that happen, appointed those who, who would be approved to be there. And that's why I, I kind of emphasized when I read it, it happened that this year that Caiaphas was the one, and it says, that year. And we know it's a lifetime appointment, so you knew that was a clue. So whether he was legitimate or not, whether he was a true son of Aaron or son of Levi, I don't know. But the high priest came um, to be considered the highest authority in the land. That's why the Romans wanted to, to mess with them, okay? So they'd have that power. They were looked on, the high priests were looked on as a political, kind of like a political king without the title, to the Israelites. But their primary duty was supposed to be religious duties, not political, kind of to keep people in line by appealing to them through their religion. Now see, God had already established the civic laws of the land, and uh, the duty of the priests was to maintain that law and the ceremonial laws through the land. Again, in Jesus' time, the Romans had taken over the area, and a lot of the religious leadership had been established by and corrupted by those in Rome. They turned the authority that established the um, <laughs> they turned the authority that established the oracles of God into weapons against his people. Okay, I'm trying to think of a way to say that, but that's pretty much what happened. Um, they they used the authority of God and used some of the laws as weapons to provoke fear, to force obedience to things that God never intended people to follow and to obey. Uh, and there wasn't that much emphasis on worshiping the true uh, living God and the worship of the Lord. Yet, God still had not abandoned his people. There were still faithful people. But the high priest was literally the only one who was allowed to come into the very presence of God in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And as such, God still used this man in his plan, even though he really didn't even realize it was happening at the time. Now, I wondered how Caiaphas could serve and stand in the presence of God in the Holy of Holies and then walk out and pronounce judgment against the very God that he had stood in there and served and pretended to worship. And then I got to thinking, you know, the same thing happened long ago. Same thing happened in heavenly places. When Lucifer was right there with God, and he decided that he was good. He was good enough to be God. He could do that job. He wanted to take God's place. And somehow he led a third of the angels astray. You know, he must have been very convincing. He's led a lot of people astray in this world even today. But brothers and sisters, we need to get to know God better and better. Lucifer was with God. He had every opportunity to know God, but you know what? He didn't know God. I mean, he, he really didn't know God. He would have known it was a fruitless effort to try to take his place. So I want to encourage you to continue to believe in God, believe in Jesus, commit yourself to him, okay? And, you know, don't, don't put any reserves on that. Well, you know, if I come up against this, I might... I might go slightly different direction or I might compromise a little bit. 
Um, I'm not saying you would, but don't. <laughs> okay. Well, let's look at, take a look at what, how God used Caiaphas in his plan. The key verse here, key statement is in verse 50. And I'm going to read it in the Amplified, which I think brings out a little bit more clarity. Where Caiaphas said, told the people in the council, Nor do you understand or reason out that it is expedient and better for your own welfare that one man should die on behalf of the people than that the whole nation should perish or be destroyed and ruined. So, you know, I'm like, was it expedient for them to bring upon themselves and the nation of Israel the blood of the most innocent man that ever walked the planet? Was it better off that the prophets, what they consider maybe a prophet, that the prophet's blood be shed to secure their political interests? Was it, uh, you know, especially seeing that there really wasn't that much to fear politically from the Romans, was it expedient for them to drive God and his glory away from them rather than to think, uh, you know, rather to embrace that for themselves? When you think it through, this pronouncement by the high priest, even in that council meeting, even in their situation, really didn't make a whole lot of sense. It seemed to be a very self-serving plot. Caiaphas was outlining here. He was promoting, I, I think, a very selfish and evil act. And it was um, driven, of course, by selfish considerations for him and probably some others that were on the council. Um, I'm not sure how, how, when people spoke against him, and we'll tap on that shortly here, but if people spoke against him, um, how fearful they were of him or how much difference it would have made and what his decision would have been. But, you know, in, in his attitude, um, he's taking and he's spinning it. We, we never see that in our politics today, do we? But they, they put a spin on it, so it's like, we're going to save our entire country. And we're going to benefit all of you by putting this man to death. And we know that only brings shame and ruin to everybody that's involved. But John makes it clear by the divine revelation in the next couple of verses that there was really more going on here. So let's keep reading verse 51 and 52. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. See, God can and does often use ungodly and wicked men to be instruments, to be tools, so to speak, to serve his own purposes, even when they're not intending to do so. So sometimes it's kind of like he's got them on a chain or a leash. You know, not only to hold them back from doing the evil that they want to do, but also as a way to lead them along to accomplish the purposes that he has, that they set out to undo and they set out to prevent. Now, another thing to note here is that when someone speaks a word of prophecy, that's not evidence of salvation and a love of God in the heart of the speaker. Okay? Just saying that. <laughs> Apply it where the Lord leads it to you. Remember the words, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? They were met with, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So we see here in this case, the prophecy aligned perfectly with what Jesus had already said would happen. And this guy was trying to oppose Jesus, but it was aligned perfectly. Jesus talked about how he would be dying for the country before. And also aligned with the Old Testament prophecies about the suffering Savior, and how he would die in his death. But Caiaphas and those who were with him, they, not even the disciples, really fully understood that that was happening at the time. John put that, put that in later on. I mean, as he's writing the story saying, this was really a prophecy. They didn't even know it. So we also have a wonderful affirmation in the next verse, verse 52, that the evil intent that a religious leaders uh, would turn into incredible good, not only for Israel, for the nation of Israel, even though they were God's chosen, but also that he should gather together in one body those who would become the children of God through Christ's salvation uh, throughout the entire world. And it goes back, Isaiah 49, verses 6 to 7, actually foretold what would happen here. He, that is Father God, says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servants to raise up the, tribe, the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of the judgments of Israel. 
I will also give you, talking about Jesus, I will also give you for a light to the nations that my salvation may extend to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, Israel's Holy One, to him whom man rejects and despises, to him whom the nations abhor, to the servants of rulers, kings shall see you and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. So, I think they're very powerful words in there. There's lots of meanings, but I'm going to kind of focus on the, the Holy One of Israel here being despised and rejected. And as much as God wants, God loves and wants to bless Israel, he says it's too light a thing that Jesus would die for just one nation. Never think about that. You know, all the families of the earth would be blessed. He knew that. He told Abraham that. There's another translation that says it would be trivial if he were to be sacrificed for just Israel. The Hebrew word there brings the connotation that it would be dishonoring, uh, you know, almost contemptible for that to happen. It's a very strong word that's uh, translated as it's too light a thing or, or too trivial. And, you know, it's just a, a preview of the honor and glory that our Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of today and that's been already given him for <laughs> centuries, for millennia by the angels. And in the future, we know that all mankind will bow to him and indeed uh, declare that he is the Lord and master of all. Now, you may remember back in chapter 10, Jesus had told him that he had sheep that were not of this fold, not of Israel only, but there would be one flock and one shepherd. So that's what we're seeing happening here. The teacher has said that, one, one teacher said that Caiaphas' vision just wasn't big enough. <laughs> you know, and he, he made that prophecy. In verse 53 then tells us, then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. They plotted to put Jesus to death. Now, if you've been following in John, it seems, it almost seems like there's nothing new here. Okay, we read before that the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus. I'm going to hit a few verses, John 5, 16. For this reason, the Jews, and when it says the Jews, it means the religious leaders, primarily here. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. John 5, 18. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God, as if anybody ever doubted that he claimed he was God. That's why they wanted to kill him. John 7, 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. John 7, 30. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John 10, 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And a few verses later in verse 39. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And just a few days earlier... When Jesus had told his disciples he was going to Bethany near Jerusalem to wake up Lazarus out of his death sleep, we read that Thomas, also called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go, also go, that we may die with him. I mean, everybody understood what was going on. So this idea that they wanted to take Jesus out was not a new idea. So what's this about? Well, now they'd gotten the green light from the main man. From the big cheese, the high priest himself said, It is expedient and better for your own welfare that one man should die. And they were talking about Jesus. Now this word in the original, again, made it very clear for the word expedient, made it very clear. It meant it's helpful, profitable, and necessary action that needed to be carried out by whoever was listening at the time. The mindset was this. Never mind about his miracles, his teaching, the beauty of his character, or even that he's the son of God. His being alive is a danger to our agenda. I vote for death. And he was the head honcho. So from that point forward, they personally, on, on two persons, and collectively took on the task to do whatever they could do to put this man to death. Now, wouldn't it be neat to be a fly? We got little flies in the walls here. Uh, be to be a fly in the wall there at the Sanhedrin Council meeting. There's like 70 different people there. Now, what we, we don't know what the discussion was, but we do know 
Some of the points were Lazarus is alive and he was dead before. Okay? He was dead and gone. Uh, we also know that, you know, Rome wants power and maybe we can kind of turn this into something that we can say, well, Rome will want to kill him for us, which obviously later on we'll see is unsuccessful. They even, well, he died on a Roman cross, but it was not because of Rome saying he was guilty of anything. And also, they were saying that Jesus wanted insurrection, but he didn't want insurrection. He was wanting to show that he is the resurrection and the life. And when there was conflict between Jesus and the Jews, we also see what came of that because of Jesus' persistence in still showing mercy and grace and kindness to those that were opposing him. We see every time that someone on that council, some of the Jews, the Pharisees, these, the leading rulers, some of them actually stepped up and, and started believing in Jesus. And so this council started to get tips. There's more people, more and more people were coming to Jesus. And um, I can't help but, but think that some of them actually stood up for Jesus, despite the fact that they were probably mocked. In fact, we know Nicodemus was mocked when he said, just a, a word of common sense a few chapters ago and and uh, they just mocked him and said oh what are you one of his disciples or you know are you gonna follow him too or you know they, they just kind of made fun of him and so I'm guessing that there were probably some that stood up and I think that's what we saw happen when Caiaphas words came out saying that you don't know anything at all okay because it didn't make sense to me for them to say things like, you know, this man is dangerous. I'm sure he would agree with that. And that we're going to lose our nation. I'm sure he would agree with that. But then he said, you don't know anything at all. I think that was in response to, to one of Jesus' uh, believers. And saying, you know, this is God. We, we, we shouldn't be going killing God. So our life lesson here is always stand up for the right thing, even during opposition. Try to make a difference. Always stand up for the right thing, even during opposition. Try to make a difference. You know, I think the difference that was made there is that God used the man who, whose intent was evil to make a prophecy of his. Okay? So it was, you know, it wasn't all, it wasn't an all was lost situation. But don't forget what triggered all of this, okay? I want to bring this back into focus. With all of this scheming and plotting, it might be easy to, to, to forget that this was all brought about by one thing. Jesus had just brought to life an impossibly rotted dead man, <laughs> okay? And in doing so, he proved once and for all he was the divine son of God, the promised Messiah, you know, king of kings, lord of lords, as he is called later on in the scriptures. It proved that all he had claimed through his teaching, through his actions, through his words and works were all true. People everywhere could have eternal life that God had originally intended for them. He had the power, and Jesus is telling people that believing and trusting in him is what brings that to people, and anybody could do that. This is the best news ever, okay? I don't want to go without saying that because that's what happened. And now they plotted to kill Jesus because of this. Uh, so there's one word for that when that happens. It's called evil, okay? That is evil. But it will be turned around by God. We know it's going to be turned around by God all the way back to Genesis 50, 20, becoming one of my favorite verses now as Joseph had spoken and yes, actually spoken in prophecy of Jesus. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Wow. Isn't it weird how no matter how unlikely that it would be, you know, the people who should be against Jesus, they were. You know, the God man, he loved people. He, he spent his entire lifetime helping people. And then in his ministry, he, he showed it even more, showed grace, compassion, mercy, Constantly used the power that he had in his hands to help people and, and taught words. Sometimes he even spoke his words, healed people's bodies. He didn't hold back in doing those things. Um, even when he was in places where he knew it would put him in danger. I mean, he knew going to see Lazarus and wake him up was going to be a, you know, almost a suicide mission. It wasn't time yet. 
We see that. It wasn't quite his time, but he didn't hold back. Yet, evil men found these things. They found other, other like-minded men that didn't like this happening. And uh, they encouraged them on each, on each other in their evil desires. That never happens today, by the way. People don't do that. Right. And they even justified themselves in an obvious wrongdoing to make it seem right. And yet, with all that collusion and power in their hands, we see it wasn't quite time for Christ's ultimate sacrifice to take place. It still wasn't time. Yet, the hour had come to show his power and glory once and for all, undeniably proving his claims for all to see, but the time for his sacrifice of his life was still about a week or so away. And, and Jesus knew that. And we read in verse so we read in verse, uh, or read in verse 54, Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. Again, I just, I, I, I point this out all the time. <laughs> Dick, you know that? We see another geographically real place <laughs> that is given, and we remember the Gospel of John was not a novel, it wasn't a work of fiction, but an eyewitness account to people that were in that area, people who, some were still, uh, some were alive when all these things happened. They'd heard about, they'd seen the events, they knew the places that were there. Ephraim was located in a wild, it was kind of a wild, uh, undeveloped, natural countryside about 13 miles to the north northwest of Jerusalem. Probably took about a day, almost a day, for the disciples and Jesus to walk up to there. But it's got an extensive view of the Jordan Valley. Um, I, I kind of thought from the descriptions I read of it and looking at the geography, I thought this is a, kind of a cool place to hide out. And you also had a place, that, I think of the old westerns, where you could, you, know, you could look out over the valleys and see if there was someone, a mob coming to try to take you, <laughs> try to attack you. So it's kind of a strategically good place to be, but um, it probably gave a lot of comfort to the disciples who were edgy. They were still thinking of Thomas as, yeah, we'll go die with you. But for Jesus, it wasn't a fear for his life. Uh, he was preparing. He was spending time away from the crowds uh, in, in, you know, in a preparation, spiritual preparation, um, to, to finish the work that he had come to earth to do. You know, he often prayed. We see he often prayed in wilderness areas to commune with his father, to rest, and um, just, again, prepare for what was ahead. So let's continue in verse 55. And the Passover of the Jews was near. I noticed that of the Jews. They didn't say God's Passover. Interesting. Um, I, always, I always think that because John, it, it was a, this was really a literal feast of the, the Lord, the Passover. But they had messed things up so that John called it the, <laughs> the Passover of the Jews. Anyway. Verse 55, the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. So the Passover, as we studied, um, was a, play, a time, a feast of the Lord, where the men of Israel were expected to attend. It was really a bright spot. It was a happy time. It was a thing that people look forward to on the, the, during the year. Uh, if my timeline is correct, this is the, the fourth, the Christ's fourth Passover that he would be uh, attending that he would be involved with during his ministry. Um, you may remember the very first time, first time he went into Passover, he cleared out the unrighteousness that was going on. He encouraged people to get their animals out. Don't make this place a house of God. This is a place for the Gentiles. This is where you're supposed to show others the glory of God and bring people to, to the true and living God. Um, so he, he did that. And John doesn't record it here. Well, we're not there yet, but but he want, John's not going to record that he did the same thing a second time when he went to the Passover. So some people say, oh, was it the beginning of his ministry or was it at the end of his ministry he, that he cleared the temple? He had to do it twice. Shows how they weren't listening. Okay, so anyway, this, this, was, meant, this was really going to be the most memorable Passover ever. Christ himself would be sacrificed as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. There's another, if you've studied in, uh, you probably have studied back in 2 Chronicles chapter 35, the scripture records another memorable Passover celebration. Now write down or, or jot in your phone 2 Chronicles 34 and 35, 
Don't read it now, but read it over later on, and you'll find a, a, just a wonderful account of what happened when an eight-year-old boy, Josiah, became the king of Israel. As he did that, he rejected a long generation of rebellion of the Israelites against God, so bad that they had actually lost copies of the scriptures. But they found under his reign, and it took a, year, a few years, you'll find, but they found the word of God that had been ignored or, and lost, and he reestablished the godly kingdom. Uh, it was verse 18 of 2 Chronicles 35, the Bible says, And there was no Passover like that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as jo Josiah kept, and the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I mean, it was just a joyful, celebrated time. And, and uh, that is, of course, until the Passover we're going to read about <laughs> that we're, we're starting to touch on in today's study. We'll get into that. I'm getting ahead of myself, but do check out that account, 2 Chronicles 34 and 35. Very interesting. Continuing now in our text to verse, 30, verse 56 and 57. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? That was kind of unthinkable. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. Yeah, the whole area was buzzing with the talk. Will he come? Will he not come? They didn't have to ask who he was. They all knew who he was and that if he came, something big was going to happen when he came. So there's also one little thing in here. Well, maybe bigger. A fact I didn't mention before about the chief priests and most likely the high priest Caiaphas. And that was that they were mostly Sadducees. Okay. Who were the Sadducees? Well, they were a sect of religious leaders that didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And that's why they were sad, you see? Okay, that's how I remember it. <laughs> Don't throw style and stones at me, okay? That's how I remember. But the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they didn't get along very well, okay? The Sadducees were more political. They tended to be more wealthy and more powerful, especially in Jerusalem. The Pharisees were more religious-like. Um, and they controlled the, the synagogues in most of the towns and cities. And as we've seen uh, by them commenting, you know, Jesus is up there teaching and the Pharisees, well, what about this? Or, oh, that guy's crazy. You know, they, they say stuff like that, interrupting his teaching. In all these little towns, even in the areas that they didn't like, up in Galilee. Uh, but now, to their credit, on the Sadducees' side, they insisted on a literal interpretation of scriptures and laws as God had given them. Now, Another conflict was the Pharisees actually gave as much authority to the oral traditions that other, the other things that man had come up with uh, that they added to the Word of God. Kind of like the, honestly, kind of like the Roman Catholic Church does today. They give as much weight to the tradition of the church as they do to the Word of God. And, um, you know, one of the examples of, of what the, the laws did is crazy. Um, you couldn't work. You know, the Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You're supposed to do your work the other days. They declared that digging a hole was work of any kind. Picking up an instrument and digging a hole was work of any kind. Well, the Old Testament also commands you, if you have to use the bathroom, go out in the woods, dig a hole, take care of your business and cover it up and get back in. And so they made it illegal in some places to go to the bathroom on the Sabbath day, okay? I mean, that was not what God said. This is what the Pharisees had done. So that was their oral tradition. That's one of the things that the Sadducees and, and Pharisees were at each other about. But in one area, we also see the Sadducees um, must not have read past you know, certain parts of the Bible because they rejected the idea of the unseen spiritual world the idea of an afterlife, the resurrection of the dead, and the Pharisees did believe in that. They taught there were angels and demons and that there was some form of life after death, even though they didn't always agree on exactly how it all worked. And so there were so many, there was a lot of infighting there. We see later on in, in, uh, in Acts where Paul actually went into the council and uh, 
you know, instead of focusing on the things they were, they were, um, they had against him, he started, he just talked about the resurrection. And that started a fight between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, <laughs> even several years later. So it's not surprising that the, the Pharisees had a lot of interaction with Jesus during his ministry, and that the Sadducees pretty much ignored him, at least until he proved them to be dead wrong in their view of the resurrection and the power of God to bring life back to people. So in fact, in the next teaching, we're going to see they actually, these people actually plotted to kill Lazarus too, because he was living proof that indeed resurrection, Jesus was the resurrection and the life as he claimed to be. So for different reasons, both groups wanted to get rid of Jesus. They, they teamed up together. They put word on the streets to report Jesus' whereabouts. Okay, <laughs> What a surprise they're going to get. We're, we'll go there in the next teaching, but now I have a few observations on their, these orders, and, and uh, we'll wrap it up pretty soon. But this was a type of all-points bulletin put on the streets, usually reserved for extremely dangerous outlaws. And it must have been quite bewildering to the people, you know, the common people that were there. Um, as they knew about Jesus, they knew what he was doing. It's like, what's this APB out on for Jesus? Why do we have to report him? And the next thing is that if either group of these religious leaders had any sense of faith in God or in their duties to the community, they really would have found something better to do. Okay, They had enough problems without having to chase down somebody that was teaching people to do good. And, and finally, we, we observe that the majority of the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and of course here in John, where did they take place? The majority of the Gospel. We're in chapter 11 out of how many? Chapter 21? majority of the gospel took place in the vicinity of Jerusalem. When? After this all points command was given to report Jesus. Much of it happened in very public places. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a hint of the surprise. You know, the triumphal entry. <laughs> you know, that was, oh, if you see Jesus, report him. And they're all in the streets. Yay, our king is here. <laughs> they weren't out reporting him. Okay, but... You know, we find that it wasn't, nobody tried to turn him in. Until when? Until Jesus himself gave the word to one of his own disciples, Judas, to go and do what you need to do. Turn, and he turned him in. He collected the reward they offered, 30 pieces of silver, pretty good reward at that time for, uh, for turning in. And so there was an incentive out there, hanging out there, nobody turned him in except, except his own man when it was time for it to happen. At the hour, it was time to happen, for everything to, to fall into place. For us, there, is, there are some good things to bring out. Brothers and sisters, always remember, as you do God's will, believe in and follow Jesus. He knows everything that's going on in your life. Maybe someone's plotting against you. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, there's, maybe it seems like your, your camper is plotting against you sometimes. But, you know, he, he is totally, God is totally in control of all these situations. Um, you got to trust him, even when the world around you seems, uh, seems pretty crazy and brutal. Um, you, not, nothing takes God by surprise, does it? But his timing is perfect, even though to us sometimes like, come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> but he loves you incredibly. He wants to bless you. He sees the whole picture, and um, he wants to bless you with his love, with his life, and his light. I want to leave you with words as I finish up here of John 1, 10 to 12. He, Jesus, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and he did not receive, his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Thanks again for coming. God bless you all.